Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. And you are very welcome to this week's episode of Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. I'm your host, Ashling O'Rourke, and I hope you are safe and well as you tune into the show. Have you noticed the evenings are getting darker? It's really beginning to feel like autumn is properly arriving. And I had to take the raincoat out of the, the hot press the other day now. And that really made me feel a little bit grim, I have to be honest. I'm fine in dry weather. It's the wet weather that I can't handle. But enough about me. Later on tonight on the show, we're going to be talking about the Rubbish Film Festival. And yes, you did hear me right. It's a really exciting initiative open to all county councils in the country to get TY students involved in making films. So stay tuned to that. And we're also going to be talking about Leash Climate Action Festival. They have a screening of the Mary Robinson documentary, Mrs. Robinson, happening this week and a number of really cool events happening this week as part of that. I've seen the Mrs. Robinson documentary not once but twice because it's just that good. So if you haven't seen it yet, Get yourself to the Dunamay's Theatre this week for the Leash Climate Action Festival to see your screening of it. It's going to be um, a really lovely evening and I'll be joined a little bit later on by Dr. Karen Moore from the Climate Action Team in Leash County Council to discuss that. But first things first. Last week on the show, we were joined by Sarah Blake of Earthology and we were talking about the impact of buying locally produced food on the environment and the benefit of buying locally produced food. And we're staying with the uh, culinary theme this week and we're going to talk about food waste. We're joined by Michaela O'Leary of Too Good To Go. Michaela, you're very welcome to the programme. Hi, Ashlyn. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So, Michaela, you are the sales director in Too Good To Go for people who haven't heard of the company just yet, what exactly is it? For sure. So To Good To Go has a very simple mission, and that's to inspire people to food, fight food waste together. How we do that in Ireland is we have an app. It's free to download and easily accessible. And what it would do is connect consumers like me and you with businesses who have surplus food left at the end of the day and allow us to purchase that food and save it from going to waste. Fantastic. So perhaps it's um, a restaurant that's only open during the day and then come half four, five, and they've got all of this stock that can't be used the following day. Traditionally, that will be binned, right? That's it. And it's it's perfectly good food. And I think, you know, some people, I know myself before I joined this company, I hadn't put food waste and the environmental of impact of food waste together my idea of food waste is when I made a stir fry and I opened the fridge a couple of days later and I had to put it directly into the compost bin. Mm. But actually, food waste is one of the largest contributors to uh, greenhouse emissions in the world. It accounts for 10% of it. We know in uh, globally that 40% of all food produced is wasted. That's a phenomenal figure to think about when you think about the resources, the money, the time and energy put into food production to think 40 percent of that is put at the bin every at the end of every day is shocking. So what we do in Too Good To Go, we allow people to save that food from going to waste, but we also hope to inspire and educate people around food waste and its link to the environment. And I think... In Ireland, unfortunately, we're particularly bad when it comes to food waste, like even like in our own households. I think it's somewhere between 700 euro and a thousand euro each year that we actually bin money that we put in the bin, food that we've bought, don't eat, goes out of date. And we like a thousand euro, like, you know, I'd bite your hand off to have that added to my bank account at the moment. You know, like it's, I know. I know. And I am, um, you know, sometimes I think when we talk about food waste, we talk about tonnage and these kind of abstract concepts. But I was at the EPA's event recently for the food waste charter for the Irish 
government. And they said that 1 million kgs of food a day goes to waste in Ireland. And we know that about 10% of that is at the consumer level. And I think something I can't speak too much about now, but in November, we're launching an educational and awareness campaign that hopes to encourage and inspire people to understand the difference between best before and expiry date better. As you said, the food that goes to waste at the end of the day in households sometimes is astonishing. Mm. And it can be very tempting. Like, you know, as we talk, it's been a long day in my house. I'm particularly exhausted. I don't really want to go and start and cook a dinner. It's very tempting to just get a takeaway. But what the too good to go app, it's somewhere in the middle. It cuts down on the amount of work that I have to do, um, but it also benefits the environment. So how does it work? Great question. And I often use it as that middle ground when I really don't feel like cooking a full meal. So as I was saying, it's a free app. You download it. And when you log in, it picks up your location and it will show you businesses in your local area who have food to save. I think in you know, your listeners area, we have some wonderful partnerships with the likes of Aldi, Centra, Super Value, where you can save surplus food um, from going to waste. And we have this concept of a surprise bag because at the end of the day, our mission is to save food from going to waste and businesses simply don't know what they're going to have left at the end of the day. So there is an element of a surprise to it. You could get a a baked goods bag full of croissants. We've got some uh, Milano's group, which I think are in Port Leash, where you can save, you know, some starters and main courses for Milano's, which I think everyone would like to save. Mm -hmm. On the app, you will see a description of what might be included, the price point and a collection window. You pay through the app. It's super simple. And then you pop in at your collection time and you collect your surprise bag. And that, I suppose, is the difference to other apps in that you you go and you collect the food. Exactly. You do. And we would always try and have collection windows in and around times people are commuting so that you can fit it into your commute or your trip into town um, and easily collect your surprise bag and come home with great food at a great price, which I think is super important. This act of using up leftover food in restaurants or retail outlets, what kind of benefit can it have? Like we're saying it's good for the environment, but but how good for the environment is it? Well, we can do like environmental equivalencies from people much smarter than I that have created it. And only recently we celebrated one million meals saved in the Irish market, which is a phenomenal amount of food to save from going to waste. And I think when I was looking at the data, one million meals saved is 26 years of a hot shower running consistently. Wow. It's the equivalent of, what is it? I think over 19,000 flights between London and Dublin or over 500 flights around the world. So we know that food waste is one of the largest contributors to the production of uh greenhouse gases and that any meal you save is actually really having a tangible impact on the environment. So then what might the food stuff be? Like, um, I think like some people might be overjoyed at the idea of a surprise bag. I'll be honest, I'm very picky, so it wouldn't be my cup of tea. So like what, what, what might you be able to get through the app? I think it's a great question. So with the likes of Aldi, let's say, They have a kind of a generic surprise bag that could have meats, it could have fish, it could have dairy, it could have fruit and vegetables, ambient product, really anything that you could find in Aldi. Then some of our partners have much more specific surprise bags based on on their their, the types of food that they offer. So Super Value, for example, has a surf and turf surprise bag where you're getting just meat and fish. So you know you're going to be getting 15, 20 euros worth of food, you can bring it home. You can cook some that evening. You can put the rest in the freezer. I know uh, we have the wander, Wandering Elk in Port Leash, which has exceptional baked goods. They sell out straight away. So you kind of know based on the business that you're buying from in and around what type of food you're going to get. I know the surprise element doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. And I suppose I just I'm just, you know, I, I kind of like my control over things, but I get the idea of this. and I do think it's really, really cool and handy as well. You know, mm-hmm. it, and like it's all about making these 
behavioural changes just easier for us to do? Because if it's easy for us to do or for us to use, then we're more likely to, to actually make these changes. Where did Too Good To Go come from originally? Great question. So Too Good To Go was started in Denmark, actually. And we actually had three or four different founders There was someone based in Denmark, someone in France, someone in the UK, all working on this concept of food waste independently. And they all met at a random environmental conference in Paris and went, hey, we're actually all working on the same idea. And the problem is big enough that I think we can all collaborate on it. Um, And our CEO, Meta, now, I was with her recently in, in Copenhagen and she was asked, why are you so committed to to good to go? Why are you growing this company so much? And she, in a classic Danish way, turned around very deadpan and she went, food waste is the dumbest issue we have in the world. And although it is a a simplified statement, I think it gets to the heart of it. Mm. Again, to think back to the fact that 40% of the food that we create is wasted when we know that there are people going hungry every day, when we know we're pumping billions of dollars into this industry, it really feels like there's an onus on us and to good to go to, to educate people around this problem and support them in taking individual steps to solve it. And it is also another way to support local entrepreneurs, local restaurateurs, <clears throat> you know, and to help keep those businesses and their doors open because we know what difficulties they're facing at the moment. Absolutely. You know, we we always position it as a win-win-win because for a business, That is food that they would have had to dispose of and pay to dispose of. So it's opening a brand new revenue stream for them, but it's also increasing awareness for them. And I think it's important to highlight businesses that are sustainability and sustainable and put sustainability in focus and want to do whatever they can to reduce their food waste. Now, before we came on air, Michaela, I said that I was in an absolute shock that it's we're talking about Halloween already because it just doesn't <laughs> feel like it should be that time of year yet. I, I'm fighting this adjustment to this new season this year. Um, but Halloween can be a tricky time of year in that, you know, no matter where you go, you're surrounded by food and you know, we're encouraged to to buy an awful lot more than we actually need. Yeah. So, so you have some tips for us. We do, we do. And as I was saying earlier, you know, we're not just about empowering people to use the app, but giving people useful information and getting people to think about how they can redistribute the food that they have themselves. So I know sweets are a big topic at Halloween. And I remember when I was younger, having like piles of sweets and chocolate left over. And I think you can keep them in the drawer. You can try and bring them in and give them away to your co-workers, but there's actually great ways to reuse them. So something I used to always do actually when I was at home, when I was younger is my mom would melt down all the chocolate bars and make it into a chocolate cake or make it into cookies or try and repurpose it. Um, I also know something that a lot of our users will do is take like the hard candies that they get from Halloween and melt it down and use it to make candied apples. You can do the same. Like if you've got toffees lying around, they're great if you melt them and put them into your coffees. So there's a lot of ways that you can take perfectly good sweets that you have at home and reuse them in a way that's a little bit different and kind of just enjoyable. I think another thing that we were spending a lot of time talking about recently is pumpkins Mm. and what you can do. Because traditionally, you know, you sit around and you carve your faces into your pumpkins, but it's actually a fantastic vegetable that should be used. I was only talking to our marketing director today about it. And she was saying that her son was like, well, we can't eat the pumpkin, mom. We have to just carve it. <laughs> um, but we, it's good to go. We're trying to let people know that, you know, you should take that pumpkin, take out the flesh, use it in soups, use yeah. it in bread. Do you know something, uh, to be frank with you, two years ago would have never crossed my mind. I would have just carved the pumpkin and put a candle into it. 
I love uh, a, I love pumpkin and butternut squash soup. Um, mm-hmm. And I know it's an, it's an effort, OK? And maybe if you've got little people in the house, they might help you scoop out the flesh and do that bit of, you know, uh, labour for you. But it is, it's really nutritious. You can make loads and lo- like if you get one pumpkin and one butternut squash, you can make loads of soup and have mm-hmm. it in the fridge for weeks, you know, for lunches, for snacks. It's such a handy thing. I've also done like curried pumpkin and butternut squash with like chickpeas and stuff and um, with a bit of feta cheese. I'm not vegetarian, but I really like that. Um, yes. So it, it is, there's more to it than just drawn on the face. It's There is. And, you know, for those who love beauty tips and tricks, pumpkin is full of vitamin A, vitamin C and vitamin E. And it can actually be made into a face mask. Oh, if- you kind of take the pumpkin out and kind of mush it down into a puree. You mix it with some Greek yogurt and some honey. And it's a super replenishing, nourishing face mask. And what a great way to reuse pumpkin. For well, self-care in the evenings. Michaela O'Leary of Too Good To Go. I'm now quite hungry, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My job's done then, <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of Let's Go Green. And I do hope for listeners that has gotten you thinking about food waste. And it's always good to know that like sometimes these initiatives can be quite city centric. So the fact that there are businesses on board across the Midlands is always wonderful to hear. We, we'll chat to you again, Michaela. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Ashling. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid, managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103, and I hope you're enjoying our show so far this week. Well, if you've been a listener of mine here on Midlands 103 over the years, you know I absolutely love anything at all to do with creativity. And when it comes to encouraging young people to get creative and conscious about the environment, well, as far as I'm concerned, that's a, a match made in heaven. And to talk to us about a very exciting new project, the Rubbish Film Festival. Yes, you heard me right. I'm joined now by Peter Baxter of Create School. Peter, you are very welcome to the programme. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So, Peter, what exactly is the Rubbish Film Festival? Well, the name is probably uh, Dad Joke Central, I think. Um, but <laughs> I, I it like it. There's a sense of humour. <laughs> Yeah, and everyone that ever hears about it, uh, uh, do you remember the name? So for the last nearly 25 years, I've been fortunate enough to work in and around Transition Year, um, quite a lot of work around there. And we were looking for a project to do as part of a a local uh, initiative in Meath at the time. And thought, wouldn't this be an interesting idea? Rather than just teaching a skill, but could we teach a skill with the purpose? And so the environmental awareness officer, uh, Bernadine Carey, came to me and said, I'm looking to do something. And I said, I, we chatted and thought, well, here's an idea. She she loved it and she loved the, the idea of the name. And it was born out of that, essentially. And we started doing a workshop. So the idea is we... Do a workshop where we teach filmmaking skills, but again with the purpose for an environmental issue. And it started in schools in Meath and ran there for uh, five or six years, just there. Now it's a national project. That is fantastic. So you're you're teaching young people how to create a short movie, essentially, mm-hmm. but with an environmental mindset. So. What exactly do um, the kids get up to as part of these? Um, workshops well part of the part of the rationale with us and what, so they're funded by the local uh, enterprise uh, the local county councils rather and we deal with the environmental awareness offices so it, it's usually the environmental department that would be heavily involved and so we do an education piece around what the stgs are and we focus primarily on 12 and 13 which is responsible consumption and climate climate action, essentially. And so they're the main focus. And we also then work on a very basic idea of film, filming techniques, uh, storytelling, lots of basic elements. Because we, 
often forget that whilst these are whatever buzz phrase you want to use, digital natives, and they're on the screens all the time, primarily, though, they're consuming. Yeah. You're watching all the time. So to have the capacity to make something, it's not just the technical skills, it's the skills as to go into that great why question, why would you make it and, and why would someone watch it? Mm-hmm. And so we're focusing on that and trying to make it peer-to-peer because why environmental awareness officers like the idea is it's a very hard market to engage yeah. teenagers. Uh, particularly with the message and it's very educative that you're trying to don't do this and do that and here's why and we all know what it's like to be a teenager (laughs) and the last thing you do is listen often so but you'll have more response listening to peers so in the workshop that's essentially what it is we talk about all of this and then away they go and we're there as mentors or uh, essentially for the for the duration of it's two days they do a workshop and we leave with the version of the film which they can go on and work on afterwards and like I think that's a really good point and it's something I, I know myself because I teach at third level young people are digital natives yes but as you say they're they're consuming content constantly they don't have the same IT skills that I think you know millennials, would have gotten like in primary school, like those of us that are around that can remember the first computer being brought into primary school. I think we got the benefit of learning how to use the tech alongside the teachers. And now because of the nature of how education has evolved, teachers are so focused on getting students through the Leaving Cert or through the Junior Cert that those basic IT skills, like I remember doing, like I did my European computer driving license certificate at the age of 12 and I was super proud of it. But actually that basic stuff, I don't think is, if it's if it's being taught, it's not sinking in, you know, mm-hmm. and, and even the basic things of like the difference between sharing a link to a file versus downloading and uploading a file, you know, all that sort of stuff. Practical stuff that young people, regardless of whether or not they go to college after secondary school, if they go straight into the world of work, they need to know how to do these things. So learning how to do it in a fun way is so valuable. Yeah, and I think people often make the assumption, and assumptions are, as we know... uh, Dangerous things, yeah. Yeah, we make the assumption they would necessarily know, oh, they're brilliant at social media or whatever it might be. They're brilliant at probably monitoring social media and watching and listening, but not necessarily having the, the critical thinking skills. And to be honest, that's anyone. I think it really takes life experience to understand, mm. particularly when you're sharing. That's a whole different mindset. It's a whole different conversation, I suppose. Mm. You kind of, until you're really probably hitting your 30s or beyond, where you have the capacity to go, well, maybe I won't post that or or maybe I will, or if I frame it this way because I've had this experience, then I know that that's more likely to engage people. So that's what we're trying to do with all of this. And we're also doing a, a, a an initiative this year where we're asking them to make digital media assets. So part of it is a, an introduction video and a, and a poster and an impact image. So to say, what it, instead of us, trying to create and share the things from your film. Why did you actually make those as well? And we can share them online or or to try and raise awareness for whatever your particular issue is. And then you're thinking about the implication of all that. And I think that'll be a really interesting one because we all know, we all post, we all share, we all read, we critique. Uh, So it's an interesting thing for them to go that, that experience where you're almost in the third person. It's not necessarily you personally, but you have the accountability and the responsibility to do this project and then you're going to share it with an audience as as part of your project. And tell me, what are the kind of topics in your experience that young people want to explore as part of this? Well, the the umbrella, SDG 12 and 13, are are pretty uh, overreaching, but the more you dig into this, it's really, really interesting topics and without giving away anything that I've seen this year so far for the films, but there's some, been some really interesting ideas, both from a local um, viewpoint and also a national and an international viewpoint. It's really interesting. But 
I, I think what what they do tend to find is the local one, whether it's fast fashion, because they are getting the the you know the way the the analytics work. They're getting this yeah into their feeds all the time. So to be able to make decisions, that that's a very popular one, fast fashion, as is uh, some more of the environmental, more about consumer change is a really interesting one because it, it, it's going to be a hot topic for all of their lives. You were talking about computers. Uh, that kind of came into my school the year I left, but uh, we never spoke of climate change, but mm. now it's almost all they speak of. So there's so many topics that are omnipresent, uh, ever present in their lives and will be unfortunately for from here on and this particular project is funded through the the county councils so if people are listening to this and they think mm-hmm. oh our school's not availing of this you know how do people get in how do schools get involved if it's something they think they'd like to bring to their county well there's 15 local authorities involved if you go to rubbishfilmfestival.com, there's a list or there should be a fairly contemporary list there of the county. Some new ones have just come on board, Tipperary have. But what the schools can do is write to their environmental awareness officer or their climate action officer. Each county has one and just ask them to get involved. They'll know through their networks how to reach out. And what happens is that the yeah, the participating environmental awareness officers on behalf of the county council, that's a big mouthful, but what they do is they agree to have a minimum of five schools on board in their county. Some have a lot more. And what happens is then we would engage with them to put out expressions of interest or if their schools are already interested. And then they select five schools. And the reason we say five as a minimum is because we have regional awards. So there's a an award for the best film, the runner-up film, and the best assets. So you really need five to make that uh, worthwhile. A bit of a, so, you know, you kind of need a, yeah. a few to take part for there to be a bit of a healthy Indeed. competition. Yeah. yeah. And then the winners of that go through to the national level. But essentially that's what happens. So the council is funding it in that we're doing a a two-day workshop at the school and then we're also handling all the awards and all the various bits and bobs. The council will usually judge it as well so, and then share. So some of the councils have actually taken the films and booked cinema spots mm. and put them on before uh, cinemas in their area, which is a brilliant idea. Fantastic. And it's a great showcase for, yeah. you know, the young people involved. Like imagine being able to say... Oh. At like 14, 15 or 16, I created something that was shown on my local cinema screen. Like that's that's a big deal. So well, you, it's that's really. huge, you know. Um, yeah. As you say, you've been working in this area a long time. And now, obviously, you know, climate change is being discussed in schools. It's part of the curriculum. There's a new module for the Leaving Cert. How have young people's attitudes changed? Are, are they engaged in the issue from your experience? Yeah, and I think it's interesting because, and this is, it's all a generalisation, obviously. I've yet to see anybody participating. Now, in our workshop, they nominate to take part. So, obviously, we're getting a a cohort of students who'd have an interest. But I think they know it's real and it's coming down the line or it's affecting them. Uh, Yeah, you tend not to get any real resistance at that level. They might hear it in their community or they might hear it from older family members maybe you know again that's a generalization but certainly not I was in rural South Wicklow today in a very farming area and doing a workshop and yeah no absolutely it's amazing people know they know from the the micro level to the macro level to beyond that everything that they're doing has an impact and everything impacts them Really interesting to see the relationship. And that hopefully will transfer to other parts of their lives yeah. as well. Well, uh, remind us now, Peter, before I let you go, um, Rubbish Film Festival, how do we find out more? The easiest way, check us out on socials. I think we've just set up a TikTok account this week as well. But uh, whatever you're having yourself, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, rubbishfilmfestival.com is the website. And you can email me, Peter, at rubbishfilmfestival.com if you have questions, love to answer them. And at the very least, go on the website. There's a YouTube channel as well. You'll see that all linked. 
go and have a look at some of the films. That's the most important thing. Find some films that resonate with you and your students. Watch them. Every there, there are playlists of all of the regional finalists from the last whatever number of years, and it's it's, it's some of them harrowing, really really impactful. Some are very funny. <laughs> it's just that yeah, they're great, and I I'm delighted to be able to really proud to be able to be part of that. Well, in my experience, there's uh, nothing as direct as uh, a story is told by youth, but. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of Let's Go Green, Peter. And um, I look forward to seeing some of the 2024-2025 Rubbish Film Festival productions. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid. Managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. We are going to turn to County Leash now and we are in the middle of the Leash Climate Action Festival and there's a couple of very big events happening this week that we, we thought we have to give a mention to. So we're joined by Dr Karen Moore of the Leash Climate Action team. Karen, you're very welcome back to the programme. Thank you, Ashley. It's lovely to be here again with you. Karen, you have a very busy week and there's one particular event we have to give a mention to. I have seen this film, Karen, not once but twice because it's just that good. Tell us about the event you have to celebrate the Mary Robinson documentary. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, so I'm actually really uh, looking forward to seeing it. I haven't seen the film myself. So it's the Mrs. Robinson documentary about uh, Mary Robinson's life and career. And we're actually celebrating it in a number of ways. So not only is it um, in the last week of our Leash Climate Action Festival, um, we also have it as the launch of a new uh, initiative from from our uh, Climate Action section here in, in Leash County Council. And that is Our World Cinema Club. So this is the first film of that cinema club. And it's in, in collaboration, this showing with Dunamay Theatre in Port Leash. And we're sponsoring complimentary refreshments before the film. And then after the film, we're having a really interesting discussion panel led by Tom Popple, who is the CEO of Be Impactful. And Tom is actually living in Leash. He lives in, in Bally Adams, not too far from, from Strad Bally. And he's going to be discussing climate inspirations with other Leash based climate heroes after the film and really following on from what inspired Mary Robinson to become a climate uh, justice advocate. He's going to speak to these climate heroes about what inspires them. So it's going to be a really great um, event for for the festival, but also uh, a wonderful launch for this new our World Cinema Club. We really look forward to it. That sounds fantastic. And I've I've been to the Dunamays to, to see um, a movie screening and it's a lovely venue for a film screening. I know technically, I suppose it's, you know, we might think of it as for um, you know a theatre, for stage performances, but they've got a lovely, lovely set up there. The Climate Action Festival, you know, it's not, we've got not just the one event. It's been running now for a couple of weeks in County Leash. So so what else is happening this week if we want to check out some events? Yeah, well, this week now is is our final week, really. And um, we're drawing to a close with uh, workshops like a swap, swap shop in Mount Mellick Library. There's a Walktober uh, being led by the Leash Chamber uh, Office. And actually another exciting uh, program that's starting as well as the cinema club, it's starting um, the first week in November is Climate Conversations for the Over 60s. So this is a six week running program really for the over 60s to learn about climate change, to identify the barriers to action. They can calculate their own carbon footprint and Mm -hmm. and then learn what actions suit them to reduce their emissions Mm -hmm. and share their progress with this lovely supportive community that they'll be running uh, this program along with for for the six weeks. Um, They actually held their first sort of introductory uh, session uh, this week 
And uh, yeah, there was nearly 50 people at it. So it was a real success. So very excited about that one. And I know that that particular programme ran in Offaly Libraries um, earlier, like as in in recent weeks, and the feedback from it was absolutely excellent. So that's um, in Mount Melick Library, did you say, or am I confusing two events? Sorry, yes, excuse me. The Swap Shop is in Mount, Mount Melick Library on Thursday the 24th. And the Over 60s Climate Conversations is in Port Leash Library. And the official kind of programme of, of six weeks starts November the 4th. November the 4th. And Karen, if we want to attend any of the events this week for uh, the Climate Action Festival in County Leash, where do we go to find out information? You can go to our uh, Climate Action se- section on the Leash County Council website and you'll find a downloadable uh, PDF of the programme there. But you can actually click in that as well and it'll bring you to more information uh, in the programme on the event and it'll allow you to actually book directly from that uh, from that document on the website there. If you have any issues with that and you can't find it, no problem. I'll give you our email address. <laughs> so it's climateaction at leashcoco.ie. So it's leashcoco.ie, the climate action section, and that will give you the, the PDF, the brochure, and you're looking for mm-hmm. uh, this week's events um, and details on how to book for uh, the events that, that require booking. But climate action at leashcoco.ie, if you happen to have a pen handy. And Karen, I'm sure if they don't have a pen handy and they simply phone um, Oris and Kunde in Port Leash, that um, they'll be able to get through to a member of the team and they'll be able to help them find what they need. Absolutely. If you just ring Leash County Council and ask to be put through to the climate action section in the community and enterprise section of the County Council, you can just ask for me by name, Karen Moore. No problem. Well, Dr. Karen Moore of the Climate Action Team in Leash County Council, thank you very much for filling in us in on all the details about the final week of the Leash Climate Action Festival for 2024. It's a pleasure to have you on again, Karen. Thank you, Ashley. We'll be back after the break. Let's Go Green, sponsored by Airgrid. Managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more. You're listening to Let's Go Green here on Midlands 103. Well, I didn't mention it at the start of this week's show, but did you get through Storm Ashley all right over the course of the weekend. We were without power for several hours on Sunday and into Sunday night. And in fact, there there may not have been a Let's Go Green had the power not come back. Um, But um, thankfully, all is well now. But I was out and about earlier on Sunday before the storm really took hold. And, you know, it got me thinking about how well prepared we are for events like this in Ireland. I mean, it was a yellow warning across the country, but I'm not sure, myself included, anyone really took that yellow warning as seriously as we should have done. There were bins put out over the course of the weekend and left to, well, be dismantled by the weather and so many other things. So, Perhaps it's an idea that as we get, we were talking last week about getting winter ready for the roads. Perhaps we need to get winter ready at home. So things like in the next couple of days, while we are having relatively calm weather and before we get proper winter ready. And I know there was a lot of people badly affected by the storm over the weekend. And I don't want to in any way downgrade that if you have been affected badly. But, you know, things like... If you're in an area that's prone to flooding, do you actually own a floodgate for your doors? Do you have a power bank for your phone? I know when I realised our power was gone in an area that I wasn't expected to go in, um, I couldn't find mine. Just clean, couldn't find it. Hadn't a clue where I'd put it last. Couldn't even tell you when I last saw it, to be perfectly honest. So... It is important that we know where these things are. You know, have a torch ready, have some candles, have a match to light the candles, particularly if, like me, you've no fire at home and you don't normally, you're not, you know, lighting candles isn't something you normally do. Um, Make sure that you have some way of lighting those candles. Uh, Make sure that the power banks that you do own are charged and you know where they are. 
And also, you know, make sure that you have a bit of food to tide you over when these warnings do come in. And I'm not saying for a second that we all need to go and go mad like we did during Storm Ophelia and buy out all the white bread on the planet. But, you know, just basic things. I think it's worth talking about the fact that there's a weather warning colour coding system in place. And when a yellow warning is issued, it's not for crack. You know, it, it, it's issued because there are going to be conditions ahead that are considered to be more dangerous than normal conditions. You know, ordinarily there are no weather warnings in place. So even if a yellow warning is issued, it does signify an element of danger and it does, or at least it should, remind us to take precautions. I was completely caught short the weekend. Completely didn't think it was going to hit the area that I live in. Just, I had heard about the seven counties in the West and that's all I thought about. Um, And... It was a genuine reminder that we need to be more prepared. We need to make sure that we have a couple of torches, that we have batteries for those torches, that we have phone charging facilities, you know, things like that, you know, and check in on the neighbours. You know, um, do you know how to manage, if your alarm goes off because of a power surge, you know, in a power outage, if your, your house alarm, do you know what to do? Do you know where you're for your electricity, if you need to call the ESB in the case of a power outage, do you know what the phone number is? And do you know what your MPRN number is? That's your meter number for your account. The other one, of course, is um, Gas Networks Ireland. Do you know those numbers? So I thought I might give them to you tonight just so that you could have them handy because it is something that, as I say, we should all have. And we, we're not, as, as a South African person said to me yesterday... We're not very well prepared for storms in Ireland and we're not. And we're certainly not prepared, I don't think, for power outages. So if you do have to, if you do suffer a power outage, the first thing I want to remind you of is the ESB Power Check website. And that's powercheck.ie. Now, if you go onto the website, now I know if there's a power outage, you're going to be doing this on your mobile phone. Hopefully you have a smartphone, okay? And if you don't, you don't. But if you do, um, you go to powercheck.ie, you allow it to see your location. It will ask for permission when you open the, the app or the, the website. You allow it to see um, your location and then you look, it'll go on the map then close to your location and you can see any, it's a little red box with an exclamation mark. If you tap on it, it will tell you when the power went in your area and when it's due to resume And if you want to, nowadays, there's a new facility, a relatively new facility on powercheck.ie. You can ask the ESB to send you updates. And this is regardless of whether or not you're an ESB customer. This is in the case of a power outage. So if you tap on that again, it brings up a facility to check your, your, um, sorry, to input your mobile phone number. And then you'll get a text message that you have to accept so that the ESB knows that you have consented to receiving updates. So, for instance, in my case, I got a text message to let me know that there was a power outage in my area. A little bit later on, they had me down because I um, live with a disability and I need medical devices um, charged and medication um, refrigerated. I'm on the vulnerable customers list. So then I got a text message to let me know that they were aware that I was on that list. And then when the power eventually came back uh, late on Sunday night, I got a text to tell me that the power had been restored in my area. Now, I suppose the lights came back on, so I knew that the power had been restored. But the point there is if the power has been restored in your area, but not in your home, well, then there might be an, um, uh, an, an issue in between yourself and the power station nearby. So it's worth being on that text messaging system so that you can receive those updates in the case of a power outage. What I don't know, though, is that do you have to do this each time there's a power outage in your area? Um, That's something I don't have the answer to. Look, realistically, we should have, in my opinion, a, a national storm warning system, like a text message that we would get to all our phones, regardless of mobile phone network, telling us that in our area in the next 24 hours, there's a yellow, orange or red warning, you know, and we should take precautions. Um, But, you know, that that might be um, 
well, logical. And often what's logical doesn't actually happen. But enough about that. So um, if you want to then phone the ESB, okay, in the case of a power outage, okay, the number there is one 800 372 Nine nine nine. So that's one eight hundred three seven two nine nine nine. So that's the ESB one, and then there is the Gas Networks Ireland. In case you do smell gas, again, it doesn't matter if you're not a gas customer. If this is whether you smell gas, you need to make that phone call. So the phone number for Gas Networks Ireland in the case of an emergency is 01920-5050. So that's 01920-5050. Now, I'm giving you those numbers. I know it's a, like a different item than what we would normally cover here in Let's Go Green. But just in the wake of all the storms of the weekend and the thousands and thousands of people that were affected by power outages. I just thought it was worth having those ESB uh, details and, of course, Gas Networks Ireland. For any incidents where you do smell gas, it's important that you contact them and report it to them. That is, I'm afraid, all we have time for on this week's episode of Let's Go Green. My thanks, as always, to the contributors to this week's show, Dr. Karen Moore, Michaela O'Leary, and of course, who else did we speak to on this week's show? It was Peter Baxter from the Rubbish Film Festival. If you want to find out how your area can get involved in that Rubbish Film Festival, get on to the Environment section of your county council. Have a great week. We're taking a break from Let's Go Green due to the bank holiday next week. But we'll be back in November. And I hope you enjoy the Halloween and uh, have some safe crack for Trick and Treat. Let's Go Green, sponsored by AirGrid. Managing and operating Ireland's electricity grid for a cleaner energy future. Check out airgrid.ie for more.